thank you for that introduction. So, so I am, as he said, I'm a professor here in KAIST's STP department. My research focuses on the Food and Drug Administration and in particular on food labeling, which is how I got interested in risk, uh, the ways risk is communicated to the public, and also concerns about regulating and safety. Um, today, however, I'm going to talk about more broadly research in science and technology studies, which is where I'm trained in looking at the role of media, how the media is changing, and it's changing science communication. So not all of this is my own research. I'm going to be presenting a, a variety of research topics. I want to talk a little bit differently uh, than the other speakers in this series about the subject. I want to talk about how, in fact, both science and the media make claims uh, to represent the public. They, they seek to be public institutions that help the public understand and, in many ways, police or uh, reform or change governance. And so you will sometimes hear people mention, um, is it possible for me just to use these? Sure, no problem. I just ask because this keeps falling. Um, so you'll sometimes hear people mention the fourth estate when they talk about the media. And the idea of the fourth estate is um, building on an older model where we had the three estates. You had uh, the aristocracy, the ruling class. You had the clergy. Just hold, hold it here? OK. Um, you had the clergy, uh, who were the class of religion, and then you had the people, the public. And in the 17th and 18th century, people started to talk about the fourth estate, which was the media and the press, which had a responsibility to educate the public, to be a balance of power against the clergy and, um, and the ruling class. Um, more recently, uh, one of my colleagues, Sheila Jasanoff, wrote a book called The Fifth Branch, looking at science and science advisors in the same, in the same light. One can ask the question, why do the science care about the public? And the reason why I ask this question is because uh, historically, scientists were often noblemen. They did gentlemanly science. They did experiments because they were curious about nature. They weren't necessarily curious about whether their projects were relevant to the public or were going to help the public. And this changed in the 20th century when scientists first started needing more funds, more money to do more elaborate research. And so they became interested in, in public funding through the government. And also, the government became interested in using science as a way of more rational governance. If we had scientists to help us better understand people, to better understand nature, this will allow us to do more um, technical projects. And so this close relationship between science and the government in, in the 20th century, what Sheila Jasanoff describes as the fifth branch, um, made science uh, become associated as a public good. Now, in this slide, one of the points I'm trying to make is that both the media and science see themselves as a public good, but they both also are special interests. Um, if journalists want to try to inform the public, they are also trying to sell their story. And so you'll hear people talk about yellow journalism, and they'll want to be sensational to sell more newspapers, for example. Similarly, uh, some critics of scientists in government argue that the scientists are trying to use the government to get more money for their particular worldview, their particular projects, money that could be spent on other things like welfare. Right, so there's this unavoidable tension um, between these claims of these two institutions as public, but also as, as private special interests. And so there's this classic expression uh, made famous by Plato, who will watch the watchman? This is the Latin version of this in Western thought. You cannot escape the fact that even these people who see themselves as their job to improve government, to, to meet the public need, who is going to watch them? One solution to this dilemma is the creation of professional norms. Both scientists and journalists have norms that help them gain credibility as public institutions. I don't expect you to be able to read all of this. I'm not going to talk about all of this today. But here you can see a wide variety of, of professional norms that scientists use to claim uh, objectivity or norms that the media use to claim objectivity. And the ad advanced or the Associated Press has a page for ethical codes where it talks about harm limitation principle. 
Um, if you're going to interview someone and then report it, if your report might hurt that source, you have an ethical obligation then to, to possibly not share that news. Um, another example is the careful attribution of sources. You want to be transparent about what your sources are. The idea with this in the media is to avoid uh, information cascades. If you don't look to see who your source is and everyone is using the same misinformation, eventually all of the media is reporting the same piece of uh, incorrect news. Same with science. The, the classic articulation this morning, the speaker mentioned Robert Merton. Robert Merton described four scientific norms that were really important for scientists in achieving objectivity. One of these is communu uh, communalism. All right, everyone, uh, pardon. Um, in communalism, the idea is that all of science is open and there's fair exchange. In practice, obviously, this is not always the case. Scientists have an interest in, in hiding or keeping their science private before they publish. But there is this idea that the scientific project is open. Disinter disinterestedness is another of these. So the idea is that the scientist is doing the scientific research because of some non-personal gain. Organized skepticism and the need for peer review. I'm going to talk about one of the problems that scientists have in the new media age because of this tradition of always having peer review and always being skeptical of every new finding or new claim. And finally, universalism is the fourth norm Robert Merton talks about. This idea that anyone can do science, anyone can participate, it's not a national project, it's a, it's a, a universal one. So I am going to do a survey of topics, and I apologize if I go quickly. If you want, if you have questions about this, any of these topics in particular, you can also email me. I don't mind sharing my slides if, and also can tell you further sources. But here are five broad topics that I wanted to touch upon that illustrate uh, how, first, this issue of the deficit model, the, the traditional public understanding of science concern about one directional communication of science um, how it exists, and then talk about examples of how, in a way, it's becoming obsolete. Um, new media, in a way, is undermining some of the assumptions that made the deficit model possible before. So I'll open talking about the deficit model and the example I know best, which is with food scares. A lot of the interest in the United Kingdom and in public understanding of science happened in the context of mad cow disease. So I'll talk about mad cow disease, mention the genetically modified food debates. Then I want to talk about how uh, this theory that it is not just the content of media that is important to how it's receiving, but also the technological uh, medium or the technology used to convey it. And I'll give the example with warning labels of how if you give risk information in a particular form, you're already shaping or framing how it's received. Uh, right now, there's a, a lot of interest uh, because of a documentary coming out in a book written by a colleague called Merchants of Doubt, looking at how the global climate change and many s scientific controversies were actually fabricated or produced by industry. And I'm going to argue that one of the reasons this is uh, a problem is because today uh, in the media you have this model of always seek a second source, always look for a contrary view, and this has undermined the, the scientific model for debate and scientific communication. Then I want to talk about science as pop culture. I think most of the public gets its science in this kind of pop culture mode, and so I think it's important for us to think about it. And then I'll conclude talking about reporting disasters. So one of the speakers yesterday mentioned the deficit model. Um, here is one definition of it. The idea of the deficit model, it is used as a critique. Uh, there is a journal called The Public Understanding of Science. If you're interested in this argument about science communication, it's an excellent journal. And this is one of their principal concerns, is criticizing the deficit model. In the 1990s, people who work in this field, social scientists mostly, uh, noticed that when scientists talk about problems, public controversies related to science or technology, they often assume the problem is that the public doesn't understand the science. And they assume that this absence of understanding is why the public doesn't accept it. And so scholars in public understanding of science 
developed this expression, the deficit model, to say that, in fact, this assumption is often false. Many times, whether or not the public understands the science is beside the point. Um, now, I'm mentioning this. I'm not going to talk about a history of it in, in great depth. But I will say that even though I think new media is challenging this, this is often the assumption that most scientists and policymakers have. It's intractable. It doesn't seem to change. Um, Alan Irwin the other day was telling me that there are still studies being done in public understanding of science that show that, in fact, this is the, 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 the dominant assumption. It is unilateral. Experts communicate to the public. Public literacy rises, and then the assumption is then the public, will, in understanding, will accept. I first became aware of this looking at risk studies in the 1980s. Um, in the 1980s, there was a lot of concern about scientists being boring and uninterested, and there was a lot of concern about loss of government funding for science. And so the uh, in risk studies, they often talked about this, this deficit of understanding about risk and the irrational public. And they would usually divide risk into two steps. You'd have risk assessment done by the scientist, and then you'd have risk management done by policymakers um, or uh, political institutions. And so the assumption was that risk assessment would be apolitical, left entirely to the scientist. Risk management, however, was clearly political. Um, in some ways, Professor Kim's talk yesterday suggested this too, this idea that you can separate these two. And science communication, in this case, risk communication would happen with risk management. You'd have some plan about how, when you're managing the risk, uh, about how you would communicate to the public and involve them. And scholars in science and technology studies argued that this is, in fact, problematic. And it became really obvious about how problematic this was in the United Kingdom. So the first thing I want to talk about are food scares, particularly in Britain in the 1990s. Um, this is a very famous image in the, 19, in the early 1990s when the Minister of Agriculture before the public with his daughter eats a hamburger to try to convince the public that, in fact, British beef is safe. And it was a wonderful example of what Sheila Jasanoff uh, described as this, this, this tendency in Britain to try to use trust in people and trust in responsible experts like this minister um, to convey to the public why they should trust him. All right. um, it became infamous because, in fact, so this is managing the public's perception of risk. The public is worried about mad cow. If I eat this hamburger, you can see, and I can get my daughter to eat it, um, they'll feel more safe. Now, two problems happened. One, the daughter didn't want to eat it, <laughs> not because she cared about mad cow, but because dad was forcing her to eat this, this, this hamburger in front of everyone. And she's like, no. And so it, it didn't work the way he hoped. But also, only a few years later, scientists discovered there was, in fact, a clear link between the disease pathogen found in British beef and uh, new cases of, of CJD, which is the human expression of mad cow. The result was deep distrust in the public for public institutions. Within a year, the Conservative, the, the conservative Party fell out of, of power. A new minister was, ministry was created for food, food safety agency that was independent of the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, Sheila, Jasanoff, and others talked about this deep civic dislocation. For me, arriving to London in 1999 and then arriving to Korea last year, I can see a lot of parallels about this general distrust that you see in people in public institutions, in the media and how it conveys it, and a need for experts that you can trust. You can imagine in, in late 1990s a similar context in, in the UK. So when scholars were looking at the mad cow debate, suddenly arriving to Europe were these unusual new foods from the United States that were genetically modified. And Europeans were naturally, particularly Britain, Brit British people were naturally very concerned about this. A debate began, and many science and technology studies scholars started looking at these as well. And when they were trying to make arguments to government agencies about rethinking this division between risk assessment and risk management, they started to say that, in fact, this division is false. 
And there are particular times where it doesn't work. So one of those has to do with the maturity of science. All right, with Mad Cow, in fact, there wasn't very good science on how the prions worked. And so the scientists weren't really qualified to make definitive statements very early on. And so this idea of separating assessment and management as the crisis was happening was not possible. Um, they argue that there are national differences in styles about how you handle risk management. In the United Kingdom, there was a tradition of assigning expert panels um, and relying on these scientists to determine it. And then consulting with the public in the United States, we have a tradition of disputed science where you have the con scientific controversy in the public um, before you then move to uh, management. And then this third point, the values embedded in science. Um, scholars argued that when you're making risk assessment claims, for example, about scientists tend to make references to best practice or typical use. And the problem with this is that best practice and typical use is in fact uh, 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 re related to the question of management. If the scientist is operating from the typical use of some food or the typical use of some, uh, some hazardous thing, they are, have embedded in the way they're doing values about what is safe, what is not safe. And so scholars were arguing that, in fact, you can't separate these two, these two um, of management and assessment. Okay. So returning to this idea of the deficit model, by the end of the 1990s, in public understanding of science, the social scientists and increasingly politicians were saying, we can't have this unilateral, one-directional model of understanding science. The public is unhappy about GM food. The more we tell them about GM food, they don't seem to accept it. And so you start to get this discussion of public engagement with science, how can we get the science more involved in this earlier on? And a lot of proposed alternatives about ways you can do this. Um, a very famous example, Brian Wynn talks about how there are different types of expertise. And when he looked at sheep farmers in Britain, and when Chernobyl radiation affected the sheep farmers, there were experts of radiation who had one idea about safety but they knew nothing about how sheep farming was done, and they knew nothing about the local environment. And so they spoke to the sheep farmers as if they were ordinary public people who knew nothing, when in fact they lacked a lot of knowledge about the local case. And so he argued that we need to engage these public people who are at risk to get a better model of how uh, risk spreads unevenly in different, different communities. There were also a lot of experiments. You, you will see today people talk about citizen science, ways that you can have lay people involved in producing scientific knowledge, um, have these uh, crowdsourcing projects. Uh, public interest groups were seen to be a possible solution. If we could have more civic society groups involved, then maybe they could speak for the public. Some countries experimented, uh, particularly France, with the GM food debate, with citizen advisory boards where they had a group of citizens deliberate on a, on a particular issue. Do we want GM foods? Do we not? What are the costs? What are the benefits? And then a few countries held public referendums, a national vote. OK. Now, the problem with this is that the public had and continues to have a very limited amount of time for thinking about all of these issues. Um, and it was unclear during the GM food debate, for example, whether European countries were asking for public input by having these advisory boards or were simply trying to give the public an opportunity to let off emotional frustration. So when I say is this palliative politics, what I mean is there's always this tension when you do these about how much are you actually letting the public decide and how much are you just providing an arena where the public has its opportunity to speak. And then you make your decision independent of that. And so one of the criticisms of the GM food debate in Europe is that, in fact, governments never had any intention to listen to the public. They were simply trying to look like they cared. Um, now, the other and the final thing I want to say about the GM food debate, today we have this very clear uh, situation where Europeans continue to not want GM foods. Uh, this is uh, polls from the 2010 Eurobarometer about what the public wants. 
and there are very clear re re returns across Europe. GM food is considered to be unnatural. Um, I would not say it's safe for my family or my health. Um, it does do harm. They reject this idea that it, it is, it's safe for the environment. So there's very strong negative opinion about GM foods. And one question that, that you have to ask is, in fact, in the science, there is some disagreement about the safety of, of GM foods. Um, there's more disagreement about the environmental risk. But the uh, agreement that the risk from GM foods is low. And so many scientists in Europe feel like this is an example where the public continues to ignore the science and continues to be irrational and say, we don't want this. Um, and I want to point out that there is a democratic question here. Does the public have the right to reject something, even if, in fact, science doesn't indicate, doesn't offer a strong answer that, they, that that's rational? All right. Does the public have the right to make what scientists might call wrong decisions? In a democracy, the public does. And this is a, a source of frustration for, for scientists. Now, my interest in the GM food debate started here. Uh, the solution, the political solution, was labeling. There was no ban. Eventually, the ban was removed in Europe. We would introduce food labels. And therefore, consumers in Europe could choose for themselves whether they cared about the risk or not. Um, in the United States, there was no labeling, and so there was a very interesting distinction between how the risk was handled. In many ways, like here in Korea, in 2008, you have this large protest about U.S. beef. Eventually, instead of the government uh, banning United States beef, which wasn't allowed under free trade, they start to introduce this origin labeling. So now, everywhere in Korea, you can look at the, the meat, and you can see if it comes from Australia, does it come from a different country. Um, so the idea is that you're passing this political debate about markets and what food is safe to consumers to let them decide what they think is a reasonable risk or not. So this brought me, brings me to my area of interest and my second topic I want to talk about. Um, and I titled this, The Medium is the Message. It's a, it's a famous title of a book by a, a, media, a media theorist McLuhan, and McLuhan argues that it's a mistake to focus only on content of the news, that we also have to look at the technologies of communication, that in fact the technologies of communication are themselves uh, giving a message. And this is what I discovered when I started looking at food labels and safety labeling. So my own research is on nutrition labels and nutrition facts and health claims, but you can see here a wide variety of labels and safety warnings that are placed. And the question I would ask you is, by deciding to put risk information in a warning label, how are you changing the way that users think about risk? How are you changing the way that uh, the political responsibility of, of government, of citizens, and also of companies? Now, the example that, that I came across in my first experience with this was up until the 1970s in the United States and in many countries around the world, food was food. And the idea was that if you wanted to make claims about health and safety and risk, you, you saved those only for prescription drugs. And for food, people only needed to worry about whether it was, it was healthy, whole, or natural. And it was prohibited in the United States to make disease claims on foods. Now this gradually changed, and in 1984, um, the Food and Drug Administration had a very clear policy saying you can't say that a particular disease is caused or prevented by a particular food because this was seen to be sensational. It was seen to encourage customers to worry about their diet unnecessarily. However, in 1984, the National Cancer Institute had this new exciting campaign where it was going to say there's new science linking fiber to colon cancer. They created all this uh, information that they were going to distribute in booklets. And Kellogg's came to them and said, hey, you have this new fiber campaign. We would like to print this on our, our cereal boxes. And the National Cancer Institute loved this because public agencies don't have a lot of money for PR, a lot of money for public relations. Uh, and suddenly, Kellogg's is going to print this on millions of cereal boxes that all, all of these Americans are going to read. So it was an opportunity for the National Cancer Institute to reach a much broader audience. And so they said, this is great. 
Um, now, this went through, and the Food and Drug Administration was furious um, because it, it actually contradicted the official policy about food versus drugs. Uh, in, the two agencies had a meeting. They were peer agencies. Eventually, the Food and Drug Administration said, we can't stop this because the National Cancer Institute was very influential. Um, and the result was over the 1980s and then continuing to today, eventually it was permitted for certain disease claims to be allowed on food. Now, this seems great because it seems like an opportunity where you have a risk, you have an opportunity for a public health message, and you can now provide it to a broad audience. But the problem is, is that by placing this disease claim on your product, what you're doing is effectively promoting this product and promoting the fiber uh, added to it. And the question I have is whether this is a public education initiative or just a private marketing. And since the 1980s in food labeling, there's been this blurring of private versus public messages, um, public institutions interested in reaching the public through private platforms, and also private market interested in the credibility of public institution. And by confusing this, you're confusing what you mean by education, a public good, and what you mean by private in terms of marketing. And so one of the things I look at in my own research is the introduce, introduction of nutrition labeling. How does this reframe the concern in public health about obesity as a consumer's responsibility? And by making it a consumer responsibility, how are you, in fact, not addressing ways that some consumers don't have purchase power? And you're not reaching those people who can't make decisions about, is this a, a, a nutritional food or not a nutritional food? Um, by going to a, a food label instead of focusing on other solutions, solutions like product bans, limiting products in elementary schools or limiting products in certain places, um, what you're doing is privatizing your public, your public campaign. <clears throat> now, there is an earlier precedent for this approach to, to risk communication. In the 1960s, the US Surgeon General released a very famous report saying cigarette smoking is bad for your health. Um, it is associated with cancer and potentially heart disease. Um, it had a, an, an impressive uh, impact on the American public. But more importantly, a few years later, the US Congress passed a law requiring that cigarette, com uh, cigarette packages carried this warning label. Warning, the Surgeon General has determined that cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. Now, this looks, again, like a good thing, because you're telling the public, be aware of this risk. However, um, if you are interested in this, the Alan Branch wrote a very long, critical history of, this, of the tobacco industry. And one of the things he says is the tobacco industry wanted these labels, because the tobacco industry knew it was going to receive criticism. It knew it was selling a dangerous product. It knew that tobacco was going to cause cancer. And it knew eventually in the United States this would lead to lawsuits where people said, you're selling us something dangerous. And by encouraging tobacco labeling in this, uh, this case in the Supreme Court, reached the Supreme Court in 1992, the, the jury said, people who smoke know that they're doing something dangerous. And it's unfair for them to then turn to the company and blame the company uh, for these risks because they know they're doing this. Um, so this principle of buyer beware or caveat emptor in the, I, uh, paradoxically worked to support the tobacco companies initially. Now this would eventually change in the 1990s, but for a period of time, tobacco companies were able to exploit this. Um, the assumption is some people are innocent and therefore we need to protect them, children who can't choose where people who work in certain places, but then people who read the label and are informed are not innocent and they know what risk they're assuming. And this is really problematic. So here is a case where if you choose to use warning labels as a solution, you're already changing the debate and, and what solutions are possible and appropriate. Now, my next example is this Merchants of Doubt uh, book by uh, Naomi Oreskes. And the reason I mention it is because, well, first of all, there's a documentary coming out this year. I highly recommend you watch it. It's, it's very well made. Um, the reason it was possible is because of the tobacco uh, litigation in the 1990s created a library with, with millions of documents uh, showing how the industry works, 
And Naomi Oreska, as a historian of, of science, was able to use these documents to actually trace and find out how the industry was interacting with the media, what its strategies were, what it knew at what point. And one of the things that she finds out is that the same group of scientists who are appearing in the tobacco case and saying, no, we don't need to worry about tobacco risk, are also appearing in other cases. They're appearing, for example, in the cl global climate change. And as a historian of science, she asks the question, why are these scientists testifying in subjects so different as global climate change and tobacco? And the answer is because, in fact, these scientists uh, were dissatisfied with the anti-corporate American politics, had very clear partisan positions, and so they created a think tank um, with industry support and started deliberately trying to produce skepticism, to, to present experts who could say, no, that the science isn't settled, um, and effectively take advantage of this tradition in science of organized skepticism. Um, so, for example, they would, if a scientist came forward saying that global climate change, and there is consensus, and we know that it's, it's man-made, and we know that it's a serious risk, they would be able to offer an alternative dueling expert who would say, well, actually, there's not consensus. Um, and this worked because the media had a very simple model for, for science journalism. When you want to present one, one side of an argument, you also want to present another one. You want to be fair and balanced. And so the media presented it like it would present politics, where you'd always have two sides to an issue, when in fact among scientists there was what they believed to be consensus. Um, if you watch the documentary, you can see that these, these uh, people hired were also incredibly vicious. They would attack scientists as people instead of just focusing us on their role. And you then see that they come across in all these different topics. Um, and so you, it asks the question, uh, who is an expert in this case? When they're called to talk about very different sciences and they're speaking on these very different to topics, um, are they speaking as a scientist? They had PhDs in physics, they had PhDs in science, but could you really fairly say that for global climate change they represent an expert? And so at one point in the documentary, Naomi Rask makes this point. It's, this is a debate, but it's not a scientific debate. Scientists are arguing, but she says this doesn't look like a scientific debate. Um, you also can see James Hansen is one of the scientists who comes forward in the, 19, in the 1980s, I believe, saying we need to be worried about climate change. And he says, very frustrated, that most scientists aren't good communicators, whereas these people who are coming forward are sort of professional public speakers and are very good um, at presenting them, their arguments in public. Um, another example of this appearance of science, the think tanks, so on the left here, you have a report produced um, by the, the, National, uh, the National Oceanic and um, Atmospheric Administration, which is a US, official US institution that produces scientific reports. A, a private think tank produced an almost exact duplicate, but with just slightly changed uh, information that looked negative about climate change, so here you can see on the right, um, and circulated it to the US Congress. And so there really is this deliberate effort to present something that looks like science um, that helps undermine this idea of scientific consensus. Okay. Um, okay, so my fourth case isn't about risk communication, but one of the speakers yesterday, Kai Kufferschmidt, at one point said that science journalists at newspapers are known as that guy who write about science because, and I'm quoting him, sometimes it's funny or a little scary, but that's okay. And I really liked this quote, because I actually think most of the time the public is thinking about science, it's thinking about it in two particular modes. Either the, wow, that's amazing, I want to see it at a science museum mode, or, wow, the universe is incredible on some documentary, or they're thinking in the, oh, this is a scary, uh, a scary risk, risky thing that we're dealing with. And so I placed these here humorously, because, in fact, the, the 1968 moon landing was this important moment where the public says we are no longer uh, many different nations, but we're one planet, uh, spaceship Earth, and it really changed our viewpoint. And I think many of the sciences and technologies today that the public is engaging with present a very different kind of um, opportunity, very much about self-enhancement, self-awareness. Um, 
And personally, as someone who likes to read science news, uh, I, yesterday when I polled my discussion group and I asked them, what is your source of news? Uh, most of the students mentioned SNS, and then a lot of students mentioned Facebook. I also get a lot of my news from Facebook. I particularly like this, this feed, I fucking love science. Um, and when I read it, I think critically. As a, as a scholar interested in how science is communicated, I ask myself, why are certain topics picked for this, this uh, feed? You know, how is she trying to engage the public's interest? How much is she trying to pick pro topics because they're um, of broad relevance and importance to scientists? And how much is she picking them because she knows you're going to want to click on it? Um, and recently, there was a study looking at how scientists, and, and just as importantly, the press offices and universities are trying to game this system. They're trying to get more attention for their, their uh, public reports. Traditionally, scientists complain, oh, the, the media always misreports us. You know, we don't use these simple explanations. And there was a study published this spring that actually showed that the press office of universities, when they speak with the researcher, tend to put certain claims in a way that will make it more likely to get picked up by the media. Um, and usually the media follows those frames. So if it's simplistic um, or not, it's often something you can trace back to the, the media office of the university. Uh, they then go into a study or consideration of how this distorts the original finding. Um, there's a tendency to move from correlation to causation, this classic problem. In, in science, so if the study shows correlation, what's reported is a causal claim. If the study uses non-human uh, non-human subjects, they tend to say that this is true for humans. Um, and more generally, this is a problem that's happening in the last 20 years, where increasingly, instead of science getting published in scientific peer-reviewed journals, there's this interest in trying to get it published in the press. So a focus on sound bites, things that sound interesting and exciting. Now, as someone interested in food, there was a, an argument I followed in the spring as well between a, a sort of pop culture, pro-science uh, persona known as the science babe who decided to write a, a, a very negative review of another pop culture food studies person, which is the food babe. And so in Gawker, which then got picked up in a lot of other media, uh, sort of popular media, um, Science Babe talks about how the food babe is trying to sell this idea of natural, but she's totally unscientific. And so you have this meme of Nemo saying, um, what if your inability to produce a chemical name doesn't actually make a food dangerous, which is one of the claims the food babe says. Um, so what Science Babe does really great, and it was a very entertaining read, is she has all these nice pop culture references. She's using curse words. She's, you know, she's making personal attacks on the food babe. And, and it's very fun reading. But I have to say, I think part of the reason why this succeeded in the social media realm is because you have this kind of cat fight. Right? First of all, the names themselves invite this kind of, this kind of thinking, because it's Science Babe versus Food Babe. Um, Part of the reason why they are able to get a lot of public interest is they aren't just selling uh, official objective credibility. Um, they really focus on relatability. This is how I feel about the subject. This is why I feel this way about the subject. And that relatability is what draws in their readers. And it's important to their online personas. OK. Now my last, uh, the last topic I want to mention is the 24-hour news cycle. And most of you in here were born after this 24-hour news cycle revolution, and so you probably don't know what it was like before we had this idea of constant coverage and that has really changed media frames. Um, and this is both true for 24-hour news cycles and more true for uh, social media like Twitter um, or here, Kakao Talk, that really helps the circulation and between people of news stories. Um, I actually joined Twitter during the, the BP spill in the Gulf crisis, and in partly I joined it because the mainstream media wasn't covering the news as quickly. And so when I was going to the New York Times, they didn't have updates, whereas on Twitter, people were posting news updates, and I said, well, this is useful. And very quickly, this account, BB Cares, which was a, a parody of uh, British Petroleum, so British Petroleum's reaction was to say nothing on Twitter. And this sarcastic account then starts to publish humorous lines like, 
that were understated, like we regretfully admit something has happened. Um, and very quickly it goes viral and people are following this humor um, that's a disaster for the company in terms of its public relations and had much more importance than what the company was eventually saying. So it's an example of how mainstream media and the control of news uh, is, is, is passing more to these alternative sources um, how, and how entertainment can often be important to that. Uh, a colleague of mine, Amy Johnson, wrote an article looking at the uh, Fukushima earthquake and the social media responses to it. So again, this is a map like the one you saw yesterday where you can see people sending Twitter messages during the earthquake and during the, the post-disaster campaign. The Twitter was very important for fundraising, but it was also being used to get information on the ground. Certain disaster response teams, excuse me, disaster response teams were often using it to locate people. People would say, I know someone who's in this location, and ironically, that they would be in the United States, but then they would send it to the disaster response, and that would help them locate people. So a very different kind of experience of disaster. And again, looking at this from uh, an STS point of view, I can't help but notice that how often what's driving the interest in the 24-hour news cycle in, in these stories um, is the visual. So if you have a video of something happening, um, that is time that you're filling your air content on. People are drawn to that. If you don't have a video, you have less of a story. And you have to then have talking heads. You have to have people talking to each other. And the public is really drawn in by these powerful videos. That was what made September 11th so, so powerful and, and upsetting. That's what made Fukushima so powerful and upsetting. It's also why on 24-hour news in the United States, we always have car chases. Is a police car chase really news? Do we need to watch the LAPD chasing a car down a highway? Is it important? Probably not. But it's video. And there's a way that this kind of content is filling time. Same with YouTube video um, and other types. The other thing I'm, I think is obvious and was better explained by um, Kupferschmidt is this idea about what does the public need to know and um, in c cases like MERS. So he was talking about it from the point of view that this fear and anxiety uh, is what makes it a media topic and how can the government do a better job of managing media. I want to ask the question of how much does the public need to know in a case like this? How much with MERS is this an important issue and how much is this something the media wants to talk about because in fact um, this kind of anxiety makes for good 24-hour reporting. So to wrap up, I don't have conclusions, I have observations and I can, I can say more if you have questions. But when I'm trying to think about uh, this public understanding of science in the new media age, for me, many of these new medias are making the deficit model, the assumptions behind the deficit model obsolete. So when I wrote the talk saying beyond the deficit model, even though this is the model I think most policymakers have, most scientists have, about why there is public uh, controversy about science and technology, I think new media is changing it. So I don't think today it is possible to, make, to bring the public in after the fact, to bring the public in in the management stage. Um, social media is creating a culture of interactivity. People want to be able to reply and be involved in Twitter. Um, this idea of constant connection. You need to have someone whose job is to constantly react or constantly work with the public on this. Um, conversely, or paradoxically, I also think there is a kind of fatigue in the public about issues. So, People who are really involved in public engagement of science are often disappointed to discover that the public loses interest after certain issues. One of the reasons for this is a new issue arises. Right? In food scares, two years ago, it was horse meat in Europe. Right? Years before that, it was the GM food debate. Years before that, it was mad cow. People get tired of one issue, and a new issue starts to draw their attention. Uh, I think. Our concept of expertise is changing culture, broadly and culturally. So on social media, credibility isn't gained by being objective and having distance from the subject. It's often gained by looking like you care. Um, so there's a, a kind of a decompartmentalization of the self. You'll have people saying, you know, I'm a scientist, but I'm also 
a, 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 you know, a foodie and I like food and therefore you can trust my diet advice because I do this myself. This is very different than an older idea of scient scientific expert where it wasn't about your personal uh, stake in it, it was about your, your impersonal knowledge. And then in English we have this expression, wag the dog. Um, wag the dog is when you draw attention to one story so that the public isn't looking at another story. And I think that this is actually a, a particular risk and danger today um, when you have disaster media coverage, that there are other stories that don't get attention because the disaster has the visual, it draws the attention like MERS, and you don't pay attention to other stories that might actually have a greater importance to the public. Um, so I worry about this shorter attention span. And I think one consequence of this constant coverage and constant news is that you create people who are also dissatisfied. They don't feel like they have a full understanding of how the story plays out completely, and so they're, they're restless. Kamsamida, thank you.